What are the consequences for an elected official to speak against the leader of their own party? Will that official be chosen by their party in the next primary? And what will be the personal toll when that leader goes after them by name, labeling them disloyal, traitor, or rhino? So I had family that sent a certified letter disowning me. They said I was a member of the devil's army. You know, we had people that would call and threaten to kill my, at the time, five-month-old child or say he, they wish he would die. Um, you think about that. I had my co-pilot from my wreck, Anderson. It's one of the most, like, intense bonds you can build, who texted me and said he was ashamed to have ever flown with me and served with me. Why? Because I disagreed with his view of Donald Trump. What if you were chosen by that leader? and work for him. Your whole circle of friends and colleagues share that leader's viewpoint. I have no illusions right now that people are gonna suddenly think I'm some hero. That's not what this is about. This has not been a fun process for me. I mean, um, the left doesn't like me, the right doesn't like me, but I have gone back to basics. And as a consequence of speaking out against the former president, I did lose my home and I was forced to flee my home. I did lose my job in the private sector. I did lose a very serious relationship that I was in at the time. I had to spend my life savings on lawyers and protection costs. And I ended up on election night 2020 in a safe house under armed guard with a pistol under my pillow mm -hmm. uh, and grappling, quite frankly, Michelle, with addiction issues. The pressure was so intense from the threats across the political spectrum, frankly, uh, that I ended up doing something I never thought I'd do is, is I took to coping uh, by drinking and in excess to the point that it almost cost me my life. Stormed the Senate floor. They tried to hunt down the Speaker of the House. They built a gallows and chanted about murdering the Vice President. They did this because they'd been fed wild falsehoods by the most powerful man on earth. Because he was angry, he lost an election. Former President Trump's actions preceded the riot were a disgraceful, disgraceful dereliction of duty. There's no question, none that President Trump is practically and morally responsible for provoking the events of the day. No question about it. The people who stormed this building believed they were acting on the wishes and instructions of their president. And having that belief was a foreseeable consequence of the growing crescendo of false statements, conspiracy theories, and reckless hyperbole, which the defeated president kept shouting into the largest megaphone on planet Earth. Now we gather due to a selfish man's injured pride and the outrage of supporters who he has deliberately misinformed for the past two months and stirred to action this very morning. What happened here today was an insurrection incited by the President of the United States. For any who remain insistent on an audit in order to satisfy the many people who believe that the election was stolen, I'd offer this perspective. No congressional audit is ever going to convince these voters particularly when the president will continue to say that the election was stolen. The best way we can show respect for the voters who were upset is by telling them the truth. That's the burden. That's the duty of leadership. The truth is that President-elect Biden won the election. President Trump lost. I've had that experience myself. It's no fun. Scores of courts, the president's own attorney general, state election officials, both Republican and Democrat, have reached that unequivocal decision. 
with you. You had said that he's a populist and an authoritarian narcissist, that character is too important to me, and it's a job that requires the kind of character he just doesn't have. That's pretty strong. Yeah, that's, that's the way I feel. I agree with that. And I do think character is, is, is a really important issue. If you put yourself above the Constitution, as he has done. But what happened? What I, turned, think, what I think that makes you unfit for on office. Was the whole January 6th thing? Uh, I, that's a part of it. I think it's a contribution of factors, but I think it really is just character at the end of the day. And the fact that if you're willing to put yourself above the Constitution, in oath you swear when you take office, in federal office, whether it's president or a member of Congress, you swear an oath to the Constitution. And if you're willing to suborn it to yourself, I think that makes you unfit for office. Does it? In our nation's 248-year history, there has never been an individual who is a greater threat to our republic than Donald Trump. He tried to steal the last election, using lies and violence to keep himself in power after the voters had rejected him. He can never be trusted with power again. As citizens, we each have a duty to put country over partisanship to defend our Constitution. This is why I will be casting my vote for Vice President Kamala Harris. I want the American people to know that I had no right to overturn the election. And then on that day, President Trump asked me to put him over the Constitution. But I chose the Constitution, and I always will. I mean, I, I, uh, I really do believe that uh, anyone who puts themselves over the Constitution should never be President of the United States. And anyone who asks someone else to put themselves over the Constitution should never be President of the United States again. How would you describe Donald Trump? <laughs> it was challenging for me, uh, coming from the disciplined, highly process-oriented ExxonMobil Corporation, to go to work for a man who is pretty undisciplined, uh, doesn't, doesn't like to read, doesn't read briefing reports, doesn't, doesn't like to get into the details of a lot of things, but rather just kind of says, look, this is what I believe. And you can try to convince me otherwise, but most of the time you're not going to do that. How did your relationship go off the rails? Well, I think uh, part of it was obviously we are starkly different in our styles. We did not have a common value system. When the president would say, well, here's what I want to do, and, and here's how I want to do it. And I'd have to say to him, well, Mr. President, I understand what you want to do, but you can't do it that way. Uh, it violates the law. It violates a treaty. You know, it, he got really frustrated. I didn't know how to conduct my affairs with him any other way than in a very straightforward fashion. And I think he grew tired of me being the guy every day that told him you can't do that. Donald Trump is the first president in my lifetime who does not try to unite the American people, does not even pretend to try. Instead, he tries to divide us. We are witnessing the consequences of three years of this deliberate effort. We are witnessing the consequences of three years without mature leadership. We can unite without him, drawing on the strengths inherent in our civil society. As I wrote uh, then, I said, you know, there are many reasons for this assault on the Capitol. But foremost among them was the president's exhortations, was the president's sustained disinformation, what you covered earlier in the show, denying the results of the election, spreading uh, the, the, these, these unfounded conspiracy theories and claims of widespread corruption. And so I think what we just saw is we saw the absence of leadership, really anti-leadership, and, and what that can do to, to our country. You know, we are in traumas, and you just talked about these with Ron, right? We have this quadruple trauma of a pandemic a recession associated with the pandemic, the social divisions laid bare by George Floyd's murder and the aftermath, and now this vitriolic partisan political season that we're still mired in. Now, when you're in a trauma, you need a leader to assure the American people, to allay fears yeah. instead of inciting fears and, and, and making them feel even more disenfranchised. We are unique among the world's militaries. We don't take an oath to a king or a queen or a tyrant or a dictator. We don't take an oath to a wannabe dictator. We don't take an oath to an individual. 
Um, I mean, you've made clear you see President Trump as a threat to democracy, not just a, a flawed candidate, a threat to democracy, you've said. Um, upon his retirement last week, General Mark Milley, uh, an ally of yours during your time in office, appeared to refer to him in his farewell speech as a wannabe dictator. Is that overstating things, a dictatorship? Well, look, if you go back the week prior, um, Donald Trump uh, said that Milley, for his behavior, whatever he thought that was, uh, was, was uh, sh sh should be punished. And he, he talked about execution, so, which was completely un unfair. Mark Milley served this country honorably for 40-plus years in war and peace, moved, uh, dragged his family around 20-plus times. He deserves our respect and admiration and not that type of talk. Uh, no less coming from the commander in chief, the former commander in chief. So, so look, I, I have a lot of concerns about Donald Trump. I have said that he's a threat to democracy. I think the last year, certainly the last few months of Donald Trump's presidency uh, will, will look like the first few months of the next one, if that were to occur. So I'll meet with Putin, I'll meet with Zelensky. They both have weaknesses and they both have strengths. And within 24 hours, that war will be settled. It'll be over. It'll be absolutely over. Do you over. want Ukraine to win this war? I don't think in terms of winning and losing. I well, just wonder what it was like for you to sit there and listen to those answers. Well, here's the silver lining. Those answers show why Donald Trump is not fit to be president of the United States. No rational person believes that you can get the Ukrainians and the Russians to agree how to resolve it in 24 hours. And the very fact he says he doesn't think in terms of winning and losing shows he's utterly out of touch with what the war is all about and what the implications of Russia's aggression against Ukraine are all around the world. You once said that he barely knew where Ukraine was. One thing he repeated that night as well was that he said if he was in office that Putin would not have invaded Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, Trump has this impression that, that uh, uh, foreign leaders, especially adversaries, hold him in high regard, that he's got a good relationship with Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin, Kim Jong-un. Uh, in fact, the exact opposite is true. I have been in those rooms with him when he's met with those leaders. I believe they think he's a laughing fool. And the idea that somehow his presence in office would have deterred Putin is flatly wrong. If anything, if Trump had won a second term and done what I think he intended to do, which is get out of NATO, Putin would have just waited and let him do it. And the, even the weakening of NATO would have, made, would have made it a lot easier for the Russians to have prevailed. He's on his revenge tour for, you know, people who dared to vote for impeachment. And I want to just warn people that once he takes office, if he were to win, he doesn't have to worry about re-election anymore. He will be about revenge. He will probably have some pretty draconian policies that, that go on. There were conversations a lot of times that people would say, that'll be the second term, that'll be the second term, meaning we won't have to worry about you know, a, a re-election. You write that you were concerned about a young press aide who was getting inappropriate attention and comments from President Trump. Should you have done more to protect her? I don't know if I could have. There's, there's not an HR department at the White House where you can go and say, hey, the President of the United States is acting inappropriately. Well, talking you can to go Mark, to the Chief of Staff. I didn't feel, I was just going to say, I didn't feel comfortable talking to Mark Meadows. I don't believe he would have done anything. So I did the best I could in terms of never letting her be alone with him in the cabin. I tried to keep her off trips as often as I could. Um, I did the best I could, I think, in that environment. Was it a mistake to work for President Trump? Yes. Why'd you do it? Like I said in the beginning, watching how people reacted to him, and I do believe he gave voice to a lot of people who did feel forgotten, but I think that many of us, myself included, got into that White House and got heady with power and became really, uh, we didn't think about serving the country anymore. It was about surviving in there. And, and, and he loved it. He loved the chaos, and that's, it's, it's bad. And it's also quite typical in this sense, you know, these, these two individuals, Nauta and the... Carlos. And Carlos are dragged into this thing, their lives turned upside down by Trump to pursue, uh, you know, this uh, caper of his. And he leaves in his wake ruined lives like this, the people who went up to Capitol Hill, these individuals, many of the people who served them in government that got sucked into things, and he just leaves all this uh, carnage in his wake. Do you think he cares about that? No, he doesn't care about that. Loyalty is a one-way street for him. 
And in many ways, you know, I, I think they, these two people down in, in Mar-a-Lago represent many Republicans who feel that they have to man the ramparts and defend this guy no matter what he does and go along with him. And uh, I think they have to be careful or they're going to end up as part of the carnage in his wake. Trump has promised that if he gets back into office, he's very blatant about this, about using the Justice Department to go after his political opponents. Do you worry that he would weaponize it if he was back in office? Absolutely. And that's why I think it's so ironic all these people are getting huffy about wep weaponization, which they should, because we can't go tit for tat. But Trump, as you say, I mean, he's very clear about it. I think there's no question that he believes these institutions should be used to go after his enemies. What can I add that has not already been said? Trump is a person who thinks that those who defend their country in uniform, or are shot down, or seriously wounded in combat, or spend years being tortured as POWs are all suckers because there's nothing in it for them. A person who did not want to be seen in the presence of military amputees because it doesn't look good for me. A person who demonstrated open contempt for a Gold Star family, for all Gold Star families, on TV during the 2016 campaign, and rants that our most precious heroes who gave their lives for America's defense are losers and wouldn't visit their graves in France. A person who is not truthful regarding his position on the protection of unborn life, on women, on minorities, on evangelical Christians, on Jews, on working men and women. A person that has no idea what America stands for and has no idea what America is all about. A person who cavalierly suggested that a selfless warrior who had served his country for 40 years in peacetime and war should lose his life for treason in expectation that someone would take action. A person who admires autocrats and murderous dictators. A person that has nothing but contempt for our democratic institutions, our constitution, and the rule of law. There's nothing more that can be said. God help us.